Good morning, everyone. It is June 3rd, and we are going through our daily devotional series on 1 Corinthians. And so, today's passage is actually 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 to 31. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Lord, we just thank you for this time, and we pray for just your grace to help us understand the words that you have chosen today for us. And as we dive into your word, Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and understanding. And that more than just informing our minds, Lord, may it really transform our lives to look more like yours and to impact those around us, Lord. And so, God, may we be the light in the dark and may we look to you for guidance always. Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. We're going to look at chapter 1, verse... 18 to 31 and I'll read to you guys real quick it says this for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God for it is written I will destroy the wisdom of the wise the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate where is the wise person where is the teacher of the law where is the philosoph philosopher of this age has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. If I were to kind of summarize today's devotional pa devotional passage it's when faith or god or the gospel collides with pride human pride and apostle paul you know paul's coming from a place where he is one of the most educated and the one probably one of the most influential people ever but even in his wisdom he is acknowledging before others that it's never going to be about how humanly wise we are or how eloquent we are or how skilled we are. But the power of gospel is not in the hands of men, but is in the spirit of God. Yes, God uses humans to carry out his agenda. But we must remind ourselves that the driving force of gospel advancement human redemption redemption of creation the correction of all the brokenness of the world is done by the spirit of god it's so easy to trust and believe what humans can do and i'm not trying here to make ourselves be down on ourselves or think that we're nothing but the reality is is proper perspective humans are capable of tremendous things good and bad but when we're talking about eternity, when we're talking about eternal transformation, we as finite beings are not capable of doing eternal transformation. Therefore, eternal transformation can only be done from a being that is eternal, and that's God himself. And so when we think about the gospel, which the gospel has eternal implications, meaning eternal consequences or eternal outcomes, it is God himself that is the one that brings about the change and transformation. And so Paul is saying in, the, in this passage is pretty much coming against this idea that God and the gospel collides with human pride and 
completely unravels it. That even the greatest of human intellect or knowledge, it pales in comparison to God's knowledge and who God is. And again, this is not to say that God doesn't care about wisdom or God doesn't care about smart people or talented people. Uh, I will say this, pursue talent, but know where that talent came from. Be knowledgeable, but understand that God gives you understanding. The response is not to be stupid. The response is not to be unwise. The response is not to be smart. The response is humbleness, humility. And you can be in a position of humility even in as you're in a place of power. If anything, you have a greater chance of being uh, displaying humility when you are in a position of power or authority or wisdom. Because you make a conscious choice to believe that, you know what, as great as I am, I know that it's not all because of me. If anything, it's because of him. And when I say him, I'm, we're saying God, right? And so, and this is the reality of the world, that the world is always going to bank on human hands to carry out progress and growth. Now, I don't, and now I'm not saying that the Christian believes or a God-centered Christian believes that uh, they have no part in the making of history. But again, it's always about proper perspective, right? And what's very interesting is that the gospel, and this is the dilemma that every believer has to come to grips with, is that not everyone is going to love the gospel. Yes, the gospel it means good news, and it's only going to be good news to those who believe and lay down their pride. A prideful person can never accept the gospel because the gospel in its beauty is only beautiful because there needs to be first a realization that we need a savior and a, a deeper re realization that we can't save ourselves, that there is no self-help book that can get us eternal salvation. It is something that we must receive like a child receiving a gift. And for prideful people, that's going to be really hard. It's going to be so hard. And you know what the crazy thing is? The gospel, it, it sounds foolish to those who can't accept this idea of a God coming down and dying on our behalf. And it comes from also a place that to receive this gift of love and grace, that one has to first admit that they, they're not that good. They have to admit that they need help. And that is something that every person struggles with. And you know how I know? It's because, think about it. How many times you find yourself, let's say, in class or at work or whatever place you may be, and the teacher or the boss asks, is there anyone that has questions? How many times, if not you, but someone in the room has a lot of questions and is utterly confused, but because of pride, refuses to raise their hand? And you know what the thing is? You might be that person. I know I am. I know there are moments where I don't, I know I have no idea what the professor or the teacher or the boss just said, and I, but I'm too prideful to raise my hand and say, you know what, I, I don't understand this, I need help. But what happens? People try to move forward and try to save face, but what happens is that they end up crashing and burning and losing all their face in the process. And so it would have been a lot easier if we just simply humbled ourselves, realized that we're not there, Realize that we're incapable and just ask for help. And it's the same thing with the gospel. The gospel looks and exposes our inability, but his capability. But we must understand that we have to lay down this belief that we can save ourselves or that it's going to be about our perfect behavior. And that it comes to a place that humanity is actually not that great in its broken state. And the good news is it acknowledges that, but at the same time, the good news is that it was never up to our hands to save ourselves. It was always going to be in God's hands, and he has done it. He has done it. He's saying humanity and creation need salvation, and it's already here in Jesus Christ. And that is the good news, that broken fellowship is made whole because he was broken on the cross. And so Apostle Paul being this great evangelist and apostle is pretty much saying, hey, um, this gospel that I'm preaching, 
Not everyone's going to like it. It's going to sound foolish to those who are dying, meaning those who don't receive it. But for those who actually believe it, they realize that the gospel in its simplicity, in its authenticity and power, is a display of God's goodness, graciousness, mercy, and also power to save. You know, the gospel is very simple in its, in what it is. The gospel is very simple, but, you know, carrying it out and living it out is the hard part, right? But so many times, we as humans, we try to complicate things that are very, very much simple. Like, for instance, the gospel is actually very simple, but we always try to make it a little complicated. You know, what is the gospel? The gospel is that you and I, we broke fellowship with God through sin, meaning Adam and Eve, which transferred to us. And because of this sin, sin separates us from God, and we are in this broken state, and we try our best to save ourselves, but we can't because we're not perfect, because we're broken. And so therefore, what, what did God do? God sent his one and only son, which is Jesus Christ, to come down in the form of a young infant and then grow up to live a perfectly blameless life. Now, I want you to think about this. How much humility and humbleness and love that needs to happen for that, for that to happen. For God in his glory debased himself to become like the very thing he created. Like he was a baby. His mother had to take care of him when he, um, no, no sacrilege, but if, when he pooped his diaper, like someone had to clean him up. Someone had to feed him. But Jesus chose this path to identify with his creation that is broken so that when he one day will lay down his life for his creation, he's not just laying down his, he's not just simply saving his art piece, his broken project, but he is able to understand the heart of those who are broken because he's experienced every sin by the the brokenness of the world by not, he didn't commit the sin, I just want to clarify that, but he understands the temptation of sin, the heart, the the brokenness of the pain in the world without ever committing sin. And so therefore, when he dies on the cross, he reaches out to the heart of man because he understands the heart of man being a man. And he's able to simultaneously bridge the gap by reaching over to the heart of God because he is God and therefore becomes a perfect bridge that reunites a broken relationship. And through Jesus Christ, living the perfect human being representing us and then dying for us so that we don't have to die. He goes to the next step where he says, you know what? If you're going to follow me, I want you to follow me to glory, not to the grave. And therefore, he doesn't stay dead, but he rises from the grave and he is glorified and ascends to heaven. And therefore, like a big game of follow leader, he says, if you follow me to the cross, just know that this ship is going to end in glory in heaven. And that's why a lot of times we have to understand that there is a cross, but there's also a resurrection. And that is the joy of every believer, knowing that our Savior made a way for us. And therefore, all we are called to do is follow in his footsteps. And yeah, that is hard. But when Jesus said in, in the gospel, he says, you need to be perfect like my Father in heaven is perfect. When we hear that, we're like, oh my gosh, that's impossible, Jesus. You already laid out to us that it, it's one thing to not murder. I mean, I think I can get away with not murdering. I think I can do that. But you're telling me also that I can't be angry because that is a form of murder. That's the beginning stages of murder. Then we're all guilty. But then you, you put on us, God, we have to be perfect just like God, our Father is perfect. That's impossible. And Jesus, correct. It is impossible. That's the first step of making it possible. When you acknowledge that it's impossible. But then Jesus, you gave us this command. How can we fulfill it? And what we don't know in the English, but is very clear when Jesus said it in the original language was that when he says, be perfect, 
like my Father in Heaven is perfect. It's not only a command, but it's also a promise. Meaning, you're called to be perfect, but I will do it through you. Meaning, it's in God's hands. And that requires us to let go of control. It requires us to be in a posture of humility. To understand we don't got the answers. For whatever reason, we thought we had all of them when we never did. And to say, God, the only thing that I'm capable of doing in this story of redemption is believing you and just following you like a child. And that requires a lot of humility. And the reality is some people are, are incapable, not because they're not capable, it's because they're unwilling to quote unquote debase themselves because they're too, too important of a person to do such, such a thing as that. And so when you look at that, the gospel, Paul is saying, you know, all we simply do is preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block, stumbling block to Jews because they can't, the, at the time the Jews couldn't wrap their minds around with this concept of their Messiah dying for them because they believed in it, like, like this almost King David as glorious warrior king that would just completely unravel all the nations of the world and reestablish Israel as a powerhouse. But when this Savior Messiah came on a donkey and died a shameful death, they couldn't, it was a stumbling block for them. They're like, even the apostles, they all stumbled and fell and ran away. But by God's grace, they came back. But what's also interesting is it is also, uh, it's a stumbling block to the Jews, but it's also, um, it's a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles because for the Gentiles, meaning everyone that's not a Jew, so we're most likely talking about Greeks, they prioritize human intellect, philosophy. And that's why Paul talks about, it's not about philosophy, it's not about human wisdom. It is not going to be about those things that save the soul for eternity. It's simply a, a childlike trust and belief in God and the gospel. You know, I, I was talking to someone earlier this week and I said this, that, you know, when it comes to faith, you don't need to know everything to have faith. Because the moment when you realize or think that you need to know everything to have faith. You're not walking by faith. You're walking by sight. And when we do that, we're not really having faith. But I, I, I'm a firm believer that not all things, but some things that sometimes when you do walk in faith, that understanding will come. Not all, not all of it, but some. But I know that from beginning to end, end to the beginning and everything in between, that if you trust in the Lord, that there's going to be like this peace in your spirit. And so, Paul is laying out in the first chapter, Hey guys, we're all Christians that are centered on God and the gospel. And if we understand these two things, then we realize it's always going to come against every idol. It's going to come against every earthly human agenda apart from the gospel kingdom agenda. And we need to realize that that is one of the primary pursuits of the church because Christians are called Christians because they're Christ followers. Not something else followers, but Christ followers. And so today, as it is today, let us remind ourselves that the gospel and God have to always be at the center of all that we do and say when it comes to being the church. Let me pray. Lord, I just thank you for this time and simple truths, hard to implement, but we have been given the grace to do so. So Lord, may we not complicate what is very simple, to love God, to love people as a reflection of the gospel message in us. 
So Spirit, do what only you can do. Comfort those who need comfort. Inspire courage to those who need courage. And remind us, Lord, that in every season you're doing something even if we cannot see. So therefore, good Father, we always ask, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.